Oh, it's not, it's not open yet. It's not open yet. How does a dinosaur become a fossil? In order to answer that question, I thought it best that we come to one of the world's largest repositories of paleontological specimens and my favorite museum in the entire world, the American, the American museum, museum of Natural, of Natural History. History. So before we answer today's big question, it bears mentioning that today's episode is really all about taphonomy. Taphonomists study what happens to an organism's body from the moment it dies, all the way up until it is ultimately discovered as a fossil, with fossilization being one part of that entire process. Usually, shortly after death, a dinosaur's body may become broken down, or even become disarticulated by hungry scavengers, opportunistic insects, bacterial decay, or even flowing water. But in very rare and ideal preservation circumstances, an animal's body may become very quickly covered in sediment upon death, as exemplified by this insanely well-preserved oviraptorid fossil. So this oviraptorid, we believe was killed when a sand dune collapsed, trapping it as it was trying to steal or prey upon the eggs in this nest. Hence the name oviraptorid, which literally means egg thief or egg stealer. But it wasn't until many years later that we realized the eggs inside this nest were also that of an oviraptorid, forever changing our view of this animal from an egg thief to a protective mother brooding over her nest at the time of death. Usually the first thing that happens in an organism's body after death is that all the soft parts start to rot away. Things like skin and muscle and fat and organs, until all you're left with are the hard parts like bones and teeth and plates and horns. Next, over the course of many years, an organism's body may become fossilized in a number of ways, but seeing as how your attention span is probably even shorter, no, mine is even shorter than yours, but seeing as how my attention span is probably even shorter than yours, we're only gonna talk about two. I really made an echo in here. The first is permineralization. And permineralization is what happens when the minerals in the earth and the groundwater around a skeleton seep into that bone and fill up the tiny, even at the cellular level, the tiny air and fluid filled spaces within that bone, essentially using the bone as a scaffolding to build a fossil. And the second is replacement. And replacement is when those same minerals in the earth and the groundwater around a skeleton seep into the bone and literally replace that organic material, building a solid rock copy of the original skeleton. And because the mineral composition of the earth differs from place to place, we end up with an array of different colored fossils, from orange to light tan, all the way up to a dark chocolatey brown. And here's a pro tip for the next time you come to this, or really any natural history museum. Because many fossils are bones that have turned to solid rock, and solid rock weighs a lot, if it is hanging from the ceiling, chances are it's not the real thing. If it's in a glass case or behind some sort of barrier on the ground, much more likely to be the actual specimen. Ah, but the preserved remains of an organism's body are only one type of fossil, and generally me and most paleontologists like to break fossils up into two groups. On the one hand, you have body fossils, and body fossils are literally any part of an organism's body. So plates, bones, teeth, feather, and skin impressions. And the second type of fossil is that of a trace fossil. And I like to think of trace fossils as clues to dinosaur behavior. So great examples include trackways and footprints, which tell us a ton about how they were moving, if they were moving in herds, how fast they were moving, and my personal favorite, the coprolite. But more on coprolites later. And that brings us to the thing of the week, which is a cladogram. And I love cladograms. So one of my favorite things about the fourth floor fossil halls here at the American Museum of Natural History is that they are laid out like a cladogram, again a tree that displays evolutionary relationships. So as you walk through the fourth floor, you are walking along the trunk of that tree. In the middle of the halls, you see pillars that represent important adaptations we found in the fossil record, and branching out to the side are alcoves that house closely related groups of animals. So as you walk through the fourth floor, you are essentially walking along the trunk of the tree that represents 350 million years of vertebrate evolution. As always, leave your questions and comments in the sedimentary layers below. Don't forget to subscribe by hitting the fancy red button. And remember, whether you're searching for dinosaurs, asking questions, or simply rooting around your couch trying to find subway fare to come to the world-famous American Museum of Natural History, never stop digging. 
A huge shout out and major thanks to Aubrey Miller and Brian Levine for helping make this episode possible, as well as all my other countless AMNH friends, especially anyone who's ever worked on or with the Moveville Museum, best educational program ever. If you want to keep learning more about what makes a line dinosaur dinosaur if you want to keep learning more about what makes a dinosaur a line dinosaur dinosaur if you want to keep learning more about what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur definitely check out our video right here if you want to learn more about what happens behind the scenes here at the american museum of natural history definitely check out the shelf life video series but until then i bid you adieu keep loving dinosaurs that made no sense i bid you adieu well i have no what's the final line we have eight minutes oh dance party Just happens to have their legs direct on their body, but does have scales.